I know what you're wondering. What is true? And what is false? The Witch Queen is an unsettling mystery. <laughs> our biggest foe, Sabathun, has our grandest tool, the light. It's paying off narrative threads that we planted way back in Destiny 1. I'm here to protect humanity. How do we stop this? The stakes in the universe are rising, and it's the greatest challenge that we've ever faced. We're shedding that dogma of light equals good, darkness equals bad. We're really entering the mists and trying to discern what's in front of us and what's lurking just underneath the surface. What is your truth now? There are a lot of bombshells in the Witch Queen narrative. And that's just scratching the surface of what we're going to get into this year. Witch Queen and Season of the Risen is chapter one and the beginning of the end for the Light and Darkness saga. We're really, really getting to the core of what it means to be a guardian. We are looking at and asking big questions about the light and darkness. We have a big bad that we've been anticipating for a really long time coming back in the, in the form of Savathun. Savathun's had a hand in most of the major conflicts that we've been involved with. We've heard about Sabathun for years and just bits and pieces and then like you see it slowly building over seasons until we come to this huge critical point. Sabathun's no longer just someone you hear about. She's not just interfering in little ways. She's now ready to take center stage. Sight. One, two, three. Sabathun, she's larger than life. We wanted to make her feel imposing and very regal and dancing through motion in some way. The light offers us a fresh start. She's yeah. very manipulative. She is very ethereal, but she also has like that creepiness to her as well. She promised she'd help us out with this pyramid ship problem that's coming our way. But the reality of the situation is Sabathun is only on Sabathun's side. We've outlived our purpose, and it is to Sabathun's benefit to wipe us off that chessboard. She's lived among us. She has played us for fools. She knows us inside and out. And she's been a step ahead of us, like, the whole way. So how do you beat someone like that? It isn't too late. You can still be forgiven. Be careful. I'll, I'll hold, hold you, you to it. it. In order to beat Sabathun, you need to understand Sabathun. Her throne world is a manifestation of Sabathun's own personality, which is in Witch Queen going through a transformation through the light. She has these areas that she's kind of trying to shun and push away. For the old hive areas, it's much more atmospheric. It's very dense. It's very claustrophobic. It's spooky. Then when you make your way into the Lucent Hive area, it's a lot more open and broad. It's definitely brighter, it's definitely more lively. We want people to look at it like an impressionist painting, something that's very pretty from far away, but as you get closer, it's not really what it seems. It's, it's very unsettling. You're looking at shapes, you're looking at these things within the world, and you're not entirely sure what they are, and you have to get close and you have to investigate. What's really going to be exciting for players is that they're going to get to play that part of psychic detective, trying to solve the many mysteries of the throne world. Witch Queen campaign, I think, is probably the most ambitious campaign we've made in a very long time. We're building the Definitively Destiny campaign, so leaning into the journey you can find in exotic missions or uh, the mechanics you might find in a dungeon. You have to kind of think your way through. You have to figure out like, hey, what do I need to do next in order to get to the end of this? We've got Sabathun, right? The queen of lies. So this campaign is full of surprises. Sabathun has all these abilities and you got to make sure that all of the abilities of the bosses would be something worthy of her. And as I kept thinking about this, you know, I felt like I was really becoming Sabathun. We've also added the legendary difficulty, which is called Become Legend. It's not for the faint of heart. It's going to be loaded with these moments that are going to be frustrating, almost like teeth gnashing. But when you get through those encounters, you're going to feel like really accomplished. Double rewards, yeah. As people who have worked on raids and dungeons before, being able to broaden that experience for any kind of player who comes in is really important. If the Witch Queen is the psychic detective fantasy and journey, 
then Season of the Risen is that same detective throwing on their flak jacket and defending Earth from the Hive Guardians and the Lucent Hive and Sabathun herself. When Sabathun shows up on our doorstep with the light, the first person to lend us help is Keitel. You want us to hit them. I need us to hit them. She's got this light suppressing technology that the Cabal were using in Season of the Chosen, and now she's going to help us use that against the Lucent Hive. When you're working with Kaya Tall, she has a different approach. It's not about asking questions, it's about getting in there and extracting. We don't really understand what happened when Sabathun actually was able to take the light. And so the campaign in Season of the Risen, in many ways, is about that story. Guardians need to stop Sabathun's advance beyond the throne world. And Sabathun poses an existential threat to everyone because she basically has an undead army. In fighting the Lucent Brood, this isn't our first time in the game fighting other light bearers, but it is the first time that we'll be facing other light bearers that have much more relentless motives. When you look at these Hive Guardians and when they do their abilities, you immediately make that connection like, oh, they are using my powers against me. As soon as we see the knight pop its super and it has two shields, you immediately are like, oh yeah, I see that connection. And then it's like, <laughs> and then you're like, it hits you with those things and then you're, you're dead. And it's just a, an amazing experience. The Guardians themselves kind of feel like a fire team that you're fighting against. They've got every class represented. The Acolyte, when that character casts, does very similar thing as the player, like the Arc Wizard. The sparks go out, it's ready to go. If you're not smart about it, if you're not paying attention, you are essentially going to have to play that fight over again. If you're successful in taking down one of these hive units that are wielding the light, you actually have to go up and kill their ghosts. That was like one of my favorite things that we were able to do in this game is just that moment where you crush the ghost. It's kind of this moral dilemma. A ghost is your companion, and now suddenly you have one in your hand and you're about to crush it. The first time it happens, you're like looking at your hand like, I can't believe what I've just done. Am I doing this? Should I be doing this? I have a ghost. Yeah, like, exactly. What, what, what is, is going on? <laughs> <laughs> Sabathun and her Lucent Brood are the most dangerous enemies we've faced so far. And so we're going to need better, more powerful weapons and tools to fight against that threat. We did a bunch of work early on looking at various different types of weapons we could add to the sandbox. We wanted to introduce a special weapon archetype that was effective more at a middle range, but also had these kind of additional roles associated with it. The glaive is a projectile weapon, and it is a shield, and it's a melee weapon. We wanted to keep that experience in first person. It has an immediacy that you don't really get when you're using a sword because the camera is so much further back. Because this is also a projectile weapon with a slower moving projectile, the onus of skill on aiming these weapons is about leading and compensating for the speed of the projectile and anticipating that. If you're in a really difficult encounter and one of your teammates dies somewhere out in the open where you normally wouldn't be able to get to them, you can bring that shield up and actually get the revive and then fall back. Glaives originate with Savathun trying to steal an extremely powerful weapon for her own use, and players will use the weapon crafting recipes that they find throughout the campaign in order to reconstruct this incredibly powerful and incredibly ancient weapon. When you put together your glaive in the campaign, you just get a taste that that's what you want to do for the rest of the weapons that you get. Weapon crafting lets you target a specific role and go and build that, and you know how long it's going to take you to get there, and you get exactly the thing that you want. I really want to see what people do with it and like the feedback that we're going to get and people sharing all of the things that they're doing with that new system. You're creating your guardian and you want to be able to shape your guardian into what you want them to be. And this gives us a great opportunity to continue to do that. This is a really big season for weapons in particular. We've got eight brand new exotics. The Osteo Striga exotic submachine gun. This is something which Guardians have made, but it's modeled after weapons of sorrow, like Thorn and Touch of Malice. Fires swarms of tiny homing projectiles that land on a target and then explode in this poison burst. 
We have an exotic machine gun where the whole idea is be the Colossus. You can launch a barrage of up to 20 homing missiles. It's a comical amount of projectiles on the screen. We're doing an exotic glaive for each class this time, and the exotic perks tie deeply into the mechanics of the classes. We think they're going to be really cool additions to build crafting. We've got, you know, the usual suite of raid weapons, destination, activity, seasonal. I recounted it this morning, and I think it's about 50 new weapons. You're going to have two new exotic armorics for each class, totaling six, one stasis, one non-stasis. The Titan stasis exotic casts your barricade, and instead of, you know, this traveler's light and the rally barricade, you create a giant wall of ice. Even though this thing is massive, you still get all the benefits of rally barricade. Warlock void exotic, we called them the devouring rift legs because we wanted empowering rift to feel like it had a place in endgame content the way that healing rift does. Empowering Rift doesn't heal you, well, what if it did? In Season 16, you're going to see a massive revamp to the Void subclass system across all three classes. This is a huge update and will allow players to build craft in ways that they've never done before. One of the things we wanted to do is create a core set of verbs like we did with Stasis. Anyone can run suppressors now. I think that's the pretty cool that's thing probably, to be I'm going to do. be running suppressor yeah. grenade oh, yeah. We wanted you to feel like you were the energy vampire, feel like you were the night stalker, feel like you were that protector, that big sentinel titan. So you're going to see things like Bastion, a new titan aspect, where you take your big old sentinel shield, slam it into the ground, and create this void barricade that's going to apply overshield to you and your buddies. My favorite aspect is probably Child of the Old Gods. As this warlock controlling space and time, I'm able to rip a hole into another dimension and then pull out this little like sentient black hole. Whenever I target an enemy, my little black hole buddy is gonna fly over there and start draining their life force. The Void 3.0 update is really setting the stage for how we're thinking about updating the subclasses for the rest of the year. We're gonna extend this philosophy to solar and arc. Solar obviously is gonna be about burning, but there's this other component to solar and that's healing. Arc, arc is all about chaining. It's all about lightning, direct attacks, quickness. We're gonna take the fantasies that you know and love today. We're gonna embellish them. So what you'll see is like all of the new abilities, all the new actions you take, reinforce that to the core. Pretty excited about it. Witch Queen is very much the culmination of the last six to seven years of just destiny all together. And really, this is starting the road to the final showdown. But things aren't necessarily just dark and light anymore. There's a lot more nuance in the game. It's going to be a real fight. Players have something that they're really going to be challenged by. I can't wait for everyone to find out what's been going on with Sabathun. Like, I'm excited. <laughs> you Guardians are so clever. Aren't you? <laughs> From the throne world to the campaign to the customizable build crafting, it all comes together to make Destiny feel really new and fresh. We've got more Destiny coming this year than any other year before. It's one of the most ambitious releases we've ever put together, and the team is firing on all cylinders. Tell me, Guardian, what do you think you're going to do?